lights out. Everybody. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Lights Out Podcast. I'm your host, Josh. As always, I'm joined in this studio by my producer, Joel. And today we are back with another very disturbing story on an individual named Alfred Packer. For this episode, we're going to be traveling back to the 1800s during a time of immense lawlessness where people just roamed the country free and people got away or nearly got away with some of the most disturbing and heinous crimes in history. Alfred Packer is known as the Colorado cannibal. So we're just heading right out to our backyard practically to cover the story of Alfred Packer. Before we get into that though, I wanted to first off say thank you to, for all the feedback on the new studio. I'm glad you guys are as excited about it as we are. But one of the things that we're doing this year that's a little bit different is we're going to be expanding sort of the topics that we cover. We kind of went through kind of four different categories in the past year, which was sort of an alien UFO story to a serial killer to sort of a dark event and then to a paranormal or haunting. But I've thought about it a lot over break and I want to sort of expand some of the horror stories that we tell here, both stories that people experience in first person. So people just like you out there. And I want to hear what sort of encounters or paranormal events you may have experienced. Yeah. Because I think there's nothing more terrifying than hearing somebody's like, first person story mm -hmm. of something they actually experience or claim to have experienced because it just gives you a whole nother sense of realness to it that it covering something historical doesn't necessarily give you because you're you're talking about something that happened a long time ago but mm -hmm. to hear somebody like oh yeah this just happened like you know a few days ago to a few years ago or even earlier in my life is is a whole nother ball game it is but not only that i've thought about some other topics that can sort of fall under the lights out umbrella and one of those is horrific accidents and i'm talking about horrific accidents at amusement parks to accidents involving things that daredevils do i guess you could say and just some of the stories around that because i think those stories as terrible they are and how as tragic as they are is also just it's much easier to connect with them because it's a lot of these things are situations or experiences that you and i might have had yeah. in the past and for us luckily nothing happened but for other people, sadly, things go very, very wrong. And I think it's very interesting to sort of dive into those. So with those things in mind, what we've decided to do is we've set up a Google form for everybody out there that's listening and watching. If you have topic suggestions, a lot of you have emailed us at lp.malhar.com and that's great. But going forward to make our lives easier and allow us to organize the information more, if you can go to our Google form, we'll put the links in the show description as well as the description on YouTube. You just go on there and you can both submit user stories. So things that you may have experienced, you can select the category of the story because in the future, I'd like to do some episodes where I basically read your guys' stories mm -hmm. back to you <laughs> and, and sort of see how that goes. And, you know, I want to know what you guys think about that. So let us know in the comments and on social media, what you think of sort of these new ideas for yeah. the direction of the show. I think it'll just help spice it up a little bit. And Definitely. Give us a little bit more you know, room to expand into some other, other things. Plus yeah. it's like, there's so many podcasts out there that do a similar type of thing. And I feel like after a while, especially if you're a big podcast listener, you listen to multiple podcasts, you start realizing there's a lot of crossover between the topics. Sure. And so with lights out, I'm really trying to push the boundary and really try to expand sort of the stories that we tell mm -hmm. and hopefully provide you a truly unique experience here at lights out podcast. And one last thing before we get into the episode, I just wanted to remind everybody that I do have a CBD company. It's called higherlevelwellness.com and all of our listeners and viewers get 10% off with code lights out. We have the best tasting CBD oils in the world. This stuff is absolutely delicious. It doesn't taste like nasty hemp, it tastes like blueberry, it tastes like watermelon, it tastes like pineapple, it tastes like mint. So if you haven't checked out CBD before, I have a ton of information on my website. Again, all of our listeners get 10% off with code lights out at higherlovewellness.com. But let's go ahead and dive into the truly disturbing life of Alfred Packer. Alfred Greiner Packer was born on January 2nd, 1842. 
in Allegheny County, Pennsylvania. His birth given name was Alfred, but he preferred to go by Alfred. He was one of three children born to James Packer and Esther Griner. When Alfred was only a child, his family packed up and moved to LaGrange County, Indiana, where his father worked as a cabinet maker. In his teens, his family moved to Minnesota where he worked as a shoemaker at a young age. He had a rough relationship with his parents throughout his teenage years, especially with his father, and Alfred couldn't wait to be on his own. By the time he was 20 years old, he had joined the Union Army during the American Civil War, and they assigned him to the 16th U.S. Infantry Regiment, Company F. But his service didn't last for long. Other soldiers saw him drop to the ground, shaking and drooling at random moments throughout the day. And soon, it was very obvious that he was suffering from epilepsy. He suffered from seizures about two times a day, which affected his duties. So he was discharged after only eight months of service at Fort Ontario in New York. With nowhere to go, he moved to Iowa, where he rejoined the Union military. In June of 1863, he enlisted in the 8th Iowa Cavalry Regiment, Company C. Alfred had a stubborn and persistent personality, even as a young man. But again, he was discharged not even a year later for the very same reason in Cleveland, Tennessee. Seeing that the military wasn't going to work out, he moved west in 1864. So at the time, the west was wild, and people thought they could go move out west and become whatever they wanted to be, whether that was finding riches and gold, or finding an alternative lifestyle to lead. So for the next nine years, Alfred tried to find himself and find what he was good at and tried a number of different professions. And this included a hunter, a wagon teamster, a miner, a ranch hand, a field worker, and a wilderness guide through the rugged terrain of the American West. Supposedly, he often got lost while guiding travelers through the West. And just like his time in the military, his seizures affected his work. Through all of his jobs, many of his employers noticed his poor attitude and hostile personality. Many of the people who worked alongside Alfred found him offensive and disagreeable. He loved arguing, and his coworkers accused him of being a pathological liar and a thief, so he never held a job down for very long. With no luck in the Union Army and no luck finding his place in the workforce, Alfred set his sights on Western gold. Like many Americans in the mid-1800s, he aimed for the Rocky Mountains with the hope of striking gold and becoming rich. He narrowed his search down to the San Juan mountain range in southwest Colorado near Breckenridge. In the 1850s, explorers had discovered large amounts of gold in the area, and by the 1870s they had become extremely rich. After the word had spread, Alfred said, that's where I want to go. I'm going to the Colorado Rockies to become rich. In November of 1873, 20 men who were all strangers left their copper mine near Salt Lake City, Utah and headed towards the gold fields of Breckenridge, Colorado. Recently, a large strike of gold was discovered in the nearby mountain range. About 25 miles into their journey near Provo, Utah, they ran into another traveler with a bushy mustache and piercing eyes. He had no money, little supplies, and only a Colt revolver for protection but he claimed he was an expert wilderness guide and knew the San Juan mountain range very well. And guess who this stranger's name was? None other than Alfred Packer. The group of 20 men were unsure if they wanted to bring this stranger along, but since he claimed he was a guide, they eventually welcomed him into their crew because this group of men didn't know the area at all, but little did they know that Alfred didn't know shit about it either. He lied to their faces about knowing the area, just so they would bring him on as their guide. And at the time, they had no clue that they had just made a fatal mistake by letting him join their company. As they continued on towards the mountain range, many of them became annoyed with Alfred's behavior. They noticed him being greedy with his food rations. Others noticed that he was constantly begging for more food and supplies, and he didn't contribute much to the group. One of the party members, Frank Miller, constantly got into arguments with Alfred along the trail, and another, Preston Nutter, described him as a whining fraud. And on top of all this, they didn't know that he was epileptic, 
so his daily seizures took a toll on the group. Also, his claim of being familiar with the area was clearly a lie. The closer they got to the San Juan Mountains, the more they became lost. Winter was quickly approaching and snow soon covered the Mormon Trail. Their horses and wagons barely made it through the snow, and since most of the trail was buried beneath the frost, they had to rely on a compass and a map for most of the journey. Since all of the men were completely unfamiliar with the area, including Alfred, they became lost deep in the wilderness. And after a few months lost in the woods, their food ran out, and hunting couldn't sustain them. There were only so many rabbits and berries to forage, and they had 21 men to feed every day. So in desperation, they ate horse feed made from oats and turnip powder, and they told themselves that they would eat the horses next if they ran out of feed. But they avoided the grisly conversation about what they would have to eat if they ran out of horses. On January 21st, 1874, they stopped at an encampment of Ute Native Americans near Montrose, Colorado. They were nervous about approaching, but their desperation forced them to enter the camp. When a few of the Ute tribe members saw the men, they ran deep into the forest. The explorers were so malnourished and haggard, they looked like ghosts. But luckily, Chief Ure was among them, who was also known as White Man's Friend, offered them food and a place to sleep for the night. He told them that they were in the Uncompadre Valley, northwest of the San Juan Mountains. And when they explained to the chief that they planned to hike into the mountains, he recommended that they cancel their plans until spring. The snow would make the hike nearly impossible, he said. Chief Ure warned them that not even his own tribe would risk the journey during the winter. He even offered to let them stay in their encampment until the winter had passed. But after two weeks at camp, the men's strength returned, and all 21 of them met together in camp and discussed leaving. It was early February and winter was at its worst. It had snowed almost the entire time, but they knew other expeditions were out there in the mountains looking for gold. So they feared that if they didn't get going, that they were going to miss out on the riches. After discussing their plans, 10 of the men had to stay at the camp with their wagons and horses, as there was no way for them to make it through the snow. 11 of the men, including Alfred, were ready to keep going, and they planned to travel to Los Pinos Indian Agency, which was the next closest outpost. From there, they planned to hike towards Breckenridge, where they would look for gold. And after they made their plans, Chief Ure knew he couldn't change their minds. The men were dead set on finding gold, even if it cost them their lives. So he gave them food for their journey and told them to take the safer passage along the Gunnison River so they could bypass the difficult terrain through the mountains. But Alfred disagreed with the chief's directions. He wanted to take the straight shot through the mountains rather than go around. And after many heated arguments, half the men wanted to follow the chief's instructions, and the other half wanted to follow Alfred. Again, he claimed to know the area very well but not many trusted him since they had gotten them lost. So the group decided to split up, and Oliver D. Lautzenheiser took four men and followed the Gunnison River, while Alfred took the other five men through the mountains. Oliver and his men left the camp first, and as they followed the river, heavy snow began to fall, and freezing temperatures made the hike more and more difficult. They followed the bank along the river just like the chief told them, but after several days they didn't have enough food to last the entire journey. And just like before, they begin to starve. Luckily, workers from a nearby government cattle camp along the river spotted the men, and they offered them food and shelter, and the men decided to stay at the cattle camp until the winter season had passed. As they knew, the winter journey to Los Pinos was impossible from the lack of food and supplies, and they hoped that Alfred and his crew would realize it too, before they were too far into the mountains. On February 9th, Alfred and his crew of five set out for Los Pinos Agency. Shannon Bell, James Humphrey, Frank the Butcher Miller, and George California Noon, and Israel Swan were the men who joined him. They still trusted Alfred, even though the rest of the original party did not. Roughly 75 miles of hiking laid ahead of them, and they began their journey on the river route that the chief had advised them to take. But not far down the river, they decided to leave the river and cut towards the mountain range. They prepared for a 14-day journey on foot since that's how long it was supposed to take in good weather conditions. But winter weather changed their plans. 
They had a little food, no snowshoes, no cold winter clothing, and only a handful of matches. They were armed with two rifles, one pistol, two knives, a hatchet, and not very much ammunition. Despite being severely unprepped for the journey, still their mind was on that gold and riches that was waiting for them hidden in the mountains. So they continued on with a guide who couldn't be trusted and not enough supplies to last them the trip. And what happened next in the Colorado mountains is still a mystery to this day. And all we have left are the stories Alfred Packer told months later when he emerged from the wilderness alone. What did Alfred do? Well, you'll have to find out right after this quick sponsor break. If you're a small business owner, you're busy enough as it is. I know exactly what that feels like. You don't have time to deal with the hassle of going to the post office. With Stamps.com, you can skip the trip and never waste another dollar or minute. I absolutely love Stamps.com. They've been a longtime sponsor of ours for years now on multiple shows. And we use Stamps.com for all of our shipping needs for higher level wellness. And I got to say, it is the easiest way to ship things. It's saved me thousands upon thousands of dollars from buying postage from the post office, as well as UPS. They now offer discounts up to 76% off UPS shipping rates, which is absolutely amazing, and 40% off USPS rates. We love Stamps.com because we don't actually ever have to go to the post office. It's very rare that we actually have to go to the post office. And when we do, it's literally just to drop off packages. It's never to buy postage because we can buy postage 24-7, 365 days a year right from our warehouse computer. It's super, super nice, very, very convenient. And it makes starting up a side hustle or business or an Etsy shop extremely easy and have that potential to grow it as big as you want to make it. Because all you need is your computer and a standard printer and no special supplies or equipment, and you're up and running in minutes, printing official postage for any letter, any package, anywhere you want to send, which is absolutely amazing, including international shipping. So save time and money this year at stamps.com. Sign up with promo code lights out for a special offer that includes a four week trial, free postage and a digital scale. And there's no long term commitments or contracts. So if you don't like it, no worries. Just go to stamps.com and click the microphone at the top of the home page and enter code lights out. Stay on track with your health goals this new year. Thanks to care of's daily vitamin packs that make organization and your resolution easy to stick to every day. Care of is a subscription service that ships high quality personalized vitamins and powders conveniently to your door every month. What I absolutely love about care of is when you go to their website, they have an in-depth quiz that asks you about your health goals and lifestyle, and it gives you personally tailored recommendations based on your answers to those questions. And then what's great is that you can either go with all the recommendations or you can customize it to just only get what you want and you can add, remove whatever you'd like. They really are the personalized vitamin company. They'll get you exactly what you need and nothing more than that. And what I love about it is that you don't even have to think about it. Once you set up the subscription, the packages just show up right to your door every month on time. So you never run out of your vitamins. And what's cool is they come in this little box that you can just like sit on your nightstand or your dresser and you just pull out an individual pack each day, rip it open and all your vitamins are already in there. There's no digging in the bottles or keeping track of like 18 different bottles, even though you might have 18 different vitamins. It's super convenient, super easy, and it helps you get reach those health goals that you're looking for and overall wellness. And since I've been using care of it, definitely have just felt better overall. And there's so many different things in there that I never thought I would need that have just overall improved my life. So care of makes vitamin shopping super easy. And right now you can get 50% off your first care of order by just going to takecareof.com and enter code lights out 50 again for 50% off your first care of order. You can stop, start your subscription whenever you want. Just go to takecareof.com and enter code lightsout 50 today. And our last sponsor for today is one of my favorites, and that is HelloFresh. Without HelloFresh, I don't know how many meals I would eat at home, honestly. With my busy schedule, I just really don't have time to make a grocery list, go to the grocery store, get all the ingredients, come home, cook the meal, then clean up. And most of the times when I do do that, which I still do that from time to time, but when I do, I end up making way too much food, so I end up spending way too much money, and then I end up wasting so much food that either sits in my fridge for a month or it just goes straight in the trash. So with HelloFresh, they eliminate pretty much all of that. All you gotta do is go to the HelloFresh website and you can pick out the meals you want every single week and you can pick them out in advance, which is really nice. You could set a month's worth of meals up 
at the very beginning and not even have to think about your meals for in a complete month, which makes it really, really nice and convenient. HelloFresh cuts back on the time you spend in the kitchen, which is super important to me and allows me to focus on other things I need to do, like take care of all 10 pets that I have and make sure they're fed. So what's great is that the meals that HelloFresh sends me, I can make in about 30 minutes or less. And they even have other quick and easy meals that only take 20 minutes. So they're all about getting a home cooked meal that's absolutely delicious, nutritious on your plate in a matter of 20, 30 minutes, which is not a lot of time, which is great. Plus HelloFresh is 72% cheaper than a restaurant meal of the same quality, which is crazy to even think about. And you can save on average over $65 per month when you order HelloFresh instead of grocery shopping. So it's literally saving you money by using HelloFresh as opposed to ordering groceries from the grocery store. So go to hellofresh.com slash lightsout16 and use code lightsout16 for up to 16 free meals and three free gifts. Again, go to hellofresh.com slash lightsout16 and use code lightsout16 for up to 16 free meals and three free gifts. Our story with Alfred picks up in the town of Saguach, Colorado, which had been a booming mining town in the 1870s. Its city center was near the Los Pinos Indian Agency where the men were headed. This agency I've been referencing was created by the U.S. government to give supplies to the Ute people and teach them how to farm. But its true purpose was to keep the indigenous people out of the way as white miners flocked into what was formerly Ute territory so they could mine the land. Not surprising that that's what the real purpose was for it. I mean, it was all about taking from the Native Americans in order to make white people rich. That's reality. But on the morning of April 16th, 1874, the men who worked at the agency were eating breakfast in the mess hall. When the front door flung open and a stranger stood in the doorway, he looked weathered by the long winter, his face was wrinkled and his clothes were dirty and rags were wrapped around his feet. In his arms, he carried a rifle, a knife, a coffee pot, and a satchel. And lo and behold, this individual was Alfred Packer. And he had just returned from the wilderness after spending 60 days out there. The workers in the mess hall quickly brought him to a table where they fed him. And Alfred ate the food so fast that he actually vomited immediately. They gave him several shots of whiskey and asked him about what had happened out there. And like any bad liar, his story would change throughout the years. He told them that he had been hired by five men to guide them through the wilderness. From Chief Ure's camp to Breckenridge. But a few days after they headed out from the camp, Alfred claimed that he had become snowblind from the reflection of the sun on the white snow, and he couldn't keep up with the rest of them, and they became frustrated. Since he couldn't keep up with the crew, the crew just left him behind. Supposedly one of the other men, Israel, gave him a rifle, the same one that he carried into the mess hall that day. And he said that after they abandoned him, he had to survive on his own and try and make his way to the town. They had left him with almost no ammo and little supplies, and all he ate were the roots and rosebuds he had scavenged along the way. But the workers at the mess hall really did not believe the story entirely, because the one thing about Alfred is that he didn't look malnourished. If anything, he looked like he had been eating pretty good over the past two months. They expected a man who had been living off roots and rosebuds in the middle of the wilderness to look like a skeleton, or literally to not be alive at all. But Alfred's face was bloated, like he had been eating really, really good. So a story didn't add up, but they couldn't do anything about it. And after he told his story, Alfred sold the Winchester rifle to the agency's Justice of Peace for nearly $230 in today's money. Alfred stayed at the agency for 10 days where he regained his strength, and after a while he told the men he wanted to go back home to Pennsylvania. So he headed into the town of Saguach to buy supplies for his journey home. He rented a room in a local saloon where he reportedly spent over $2,000 in today's money, and he spent almost another $2,000 at the general store for supplies. And some of the locals even reported that he had four different wallets with him. And they're like, hmm, that's kind of odd. While he spent a few days at the saloon, he gambled away his money and got drunk almost every day. He sat at the bar and told the locals about his journey through the Rockies. And as he told his story of what happened in the wilderness, pieces of the story didn't seem to add up. He began to say things that conflicted with his previous stories. 
The fact that he had so much money didn't look malnourished, and the other five men hadn't reached town yet made the locals suspicious of Alfred. And as you can imagine, rumors began spreading through town. Soon, Preston Nutter, one of the men that had stayed at Chief Ure's camp through the winter, arrived in Saguach. And he actually found Alfred at the saloon and recognized him by his laugh. And when he confronted him, he was like, yo, where's the rest of the crew? Why are you the only one that returned? Alfred told a story about how he was abandoned by the rest of the men. But Preston didn't believe a word of it. It wouldn't have made sense for five men unfamiliar with the area to abandon their guide. And he also noticed that Alfred had Frank Miller's skinning knife. And he asked him how he had gotten it. And Alfred said that Frank had stabbed the knife into the trunk of a tree and left it behind. So he figured he'd take it for himself. This really pissed Preston off. And he accused Alfred of being a liar and a petty thief and even threatened to hang him. Meanwhile, the five men who had taken the river passageway had finally made it to Los Pinos Indian Agency. They were greeted by the head of the agency, General Charles Adams, and he told them another member of their crew, Alfred Packer, had already arrived. When the general told the men that Alfred claimed that the others had abandoned him, all five of the men immediately knew that Alfred was lying, because they knew that Alfred was a pathological liar, and he couldn't be trusted. They convinced the general to send an agency officer on horse to Saguach, and they needed to bring Alfred back for questioning before he fled. And when the officer trekked over to the town, he found Alfred as he was packing up and getting ready to leave. When the officer contacted Alfred, Alfred agreed to return to the agency with the officer, and he hopped on his brand new horse and followed the officer back to Los Pinos. When he arrived for questioning, he told them the same story from when he first arrived that he had been abandoned by the other men, but no one believed him. When they asked him about how he got all the money, Alfred said that he took out a cash loan in Saguach, but when they asked around town, no one admitted to giving him a loan. The questioning had turned into an interrogation when two Ute tribesmen returned to Los Pinos with several strips of human meat. They called it white man's meat, and they said that they had found it on a hill near the agency. As the men all looked at each other, the pieces of the puzzle came together. It was clear that something horrific had happened out in the wilderness, and Alfred had only survived because he had indulged in one of the most taboo behaviors known to man, cannibalism. Alfred broke down in front of the men and told them a new version of his story. The agency clerk transcribed his first statement during the questioning. Alfred said that he and the other five men had only expected a 14-day journey through the wilderness. But as the days passed and the food ran low, it was obvious they weren't going to make it in time. When their food ran out, they survived on roots, pine gum, rosebuds, and any rabbits that they could hunt. But as the winter conditions worsened, it became harder to find food. And slowly, all the men began starving to death. In one final version of his story, Alfred said that he had left the camp and gone by himself to find firewood one day. And when he returned to the camp, he found four of the men butchering Israel's body. One of the men had struck him in the head with a hatchet and killed him instantly. And then they began stripping his flesh and gathering up his muscles to eat. Alfred decided to join them in the butchering. And they also found a few thousand dollars that they divided between each other. After they butchered what was left of Israel's body, they drained the blood and cooked the meat. And since they were starving, they ate most of what they could and packed up the rest. Alfred took Israel's rifle and they continued on their journey through the woods. And after two more days of hiking, they couldn't find any rabbits. So they had to resort to cannibalism again. In secret, the men decided that they would kill Frank Miller next. He was a stocky man and the amount of meat they could get out of him was more than anyone else. And just like Israel, they killed him with a hatchet to the head as he bent down to pick up firewood. And again, they butchered him, cooked him, and ate him. This was also how Alfred got Frank's knife and took it for himself. They also divided up his money amongst themselves. And soon enough, James and George were also killed and eaten, which left only Alfred and Shannon Bell. At that point, they swore on Almighty God that they wouldn't eat each other. They each had a rifle and a couple thousand dollars in cash, 
and they figured they could make the rest of the journey with the food they found along the way. They made a pact and agreed they would say the four men had died from the harsh winter conditions and that they had buried them, and they promised to never speak about cannibalism ever again. But after days and days of not finding food, Shannon Bell couldn't take it anymore. Alfred told the men that Shannon snapped one night and ran at him with his rifle raised, but Alfred blocked the attack and sunk the hatchet straight into Shannon's head. And just like the rest, Alfred butchered Shannon's body and ate until he was full. He packed the rest of the meat into his satchel and continued on. And by the time he reached Los Pinos Indian Agency, he threw the rest of Shannon's meat into the snow, hoping that a wild animal would eat it. But instead, the Ute men ended up finding them days later. In his first confession, Alfred said he had grown an appetite for human flesh, especially the breast area. It was lean and juicy, and he could survive on it for a very long time. After General Adams and the other men heard Alfred's first confession, the general called for a conference to decide what they should do without him. They decided they should form a search party and look for the bodies. With the assistance of the Ute men and Alfred acting as a guide, they went to look for the remains. But after a few hours of hiking, Alfred claimed they were lost and he didn't know where the bodies were. So they all decided to abandon the search. On the return trip to Los Pinos, Alfred had a hidden knife on his person and tried to attack and kill an officer. But they stopped him, and they wrestled him to the ground and restrained him. After this, General Adams was so fed up with Alfred that they transported him back to Saguach and threw him in jail just outside of town on the local sheriff's property. And while in jail, another version of the story came to light. He told authorities that what he had told the general and the other men was untrue. He now told a new story that became his first official confession. This was his new version. He said that the crew had encountered a blizzard during the rough passage through the mountains, and they had become lost and unable to retrace their steps because the snow had filled their footprints. They soon ran out of food and days went by without any sign of rabbits, deer, or other wildlife. They ended up cooking and eating their leather shoes because they were so hungry, and then they wrapped their feet in rags. Alfred said that all six of them agreed that if one of them died, they were allowed to harvest and eat them for survival. Israel Swan, who was in his mid-sixties, was the first to die ten days after leaving the Ute encampment. He died from a combination of hunger and exposure to the elements. So like they had all agreed upon, they butchered him and ate him. And after four or five more days, James ended up dying as well, and he had about $133 in his pocket, and they split the money amongst themselves. Soon after, Frank was killed by the other men and they told Alfred that he had died accidentally. But regardless of this, they ate him. Shannon then shot George with a hunting rifle, and then Alfred shot Shannon in self-defense. So after about two weeks, everyone was dead besides Alfred. He covered up the remains of the dead men, but before he buried them, he cut out a long piece of meat from one of the bodies and took it with him. It took him another 14 days to reach the agency. And even after his official confession in jail, he changed his story yet again. He said they survived on food rations, hunting and foraging for about 20 days after leaving the Ute encampment, and then starved for 10 days before Israel died. Then James died from the extreme cold, and George was killed a few days later by Shannon. And after they had eaten all that was left of the first three men, only Shannon and Alfred were left. In desperation, Shannon charged at Alfred, but instead of defending himself with a hatchet, he actually killed Shannon with a pistol. Alfred then confessed to stealing all the valuables left behind, but he didn't list the exact items or how much money he took. And as the versions of his story continued to change and evolve, the less the authorities believed them. As Alfred sat in jail, the spring and summer seasons passed. In August, John A. Rudolph, an illustrator working for Harper's Weekly magazine, traveled through the area. He crossed through the same lands that Alfred and his men had crossed on their way to Los Pinos Agency. Above the fork of the Gunnison River, he discovered the bodies of all five men at the foot of Slumgullion Pass. The area roughly matched the description that Alfred had given when he told the story of killing Shannon Bell, and it was only two miles southeast of Lake City, Colorado. If they had only traveled a bit further, they could have found the city, 
but with Alfred as their guide, they were doomed from the very start. The five bodies rested in a ditch, half decayed and withering away. The winter snow had initially covered the bodies, but as the summer months came, the snow melted, and the bodies quickly decayed. After John discovered the bodies, he made a detailed illustration and alerted the authorities when he reached Lake City. Harper's Weekly Magazine published his illustration two months later on October 17, 1874, and it's pretty grim. They also published the story of Alfred Packer and his crew, which became one of many stories, as Alfred would soon gain national attention and infamy. Once authorities heard about the five bodies, they sent a local coroner, law enforcement, and 20 volunteers to the foot of Slumgullion Pass. And when they arrived, the slow summer decay and the scavenging animals had left the bodies in an absolute mess. Rotted flesh and maggots covered their bones, and the wind carried the smell of death for several yards. They could smell the bodies before they could even see them. And when they approached, they saw the bodies lying in different positions. Frank Miller's head was completely gone and nowhere to be found, and they assumed it had been carried off by an animal. Most of Frank's and Israel's bodies had been scavenged by animals. Almost nothing remained besides their skeletons covered in shreds of clothes. A jagged chunk of skull was missing from Israel's head, like he had been struck by something. Nearby, the bodies of George Noon and James Humphrey laid on their backs, and their chests had been torn open by animals, and their legs were completely skeletal. Both of their faces were still intact, but their skin had sunk down to the bone. On top of their heads were broken skulls that looked like they had been hit with a hatchet. And the last corpse, Shannon Bell, laid with his skeleton legs spread out and his arms to the side. It looked as if the skin and muscle of his arms had been crudely cut off with a knife, and his hands were completely skinned. Flies and maggots ate away his chest that had been flayed open, and surprisingly his face had decayed the least out of all of them. A thick red beard covered his face, and his bushy hair fell from the sides of his head. It looked like he had been the last to die. The top of his skulls cracked open, and the last of his brains had poured out onto the ground in a dark pool of decay. The coroner noticed that the three bodies that were still partially intact had flesh and muscle removed by choice, and none of the bone marrow or organs had been removed. This was unusual because if someone was starving to death, they would eat the bone marrow and organs. And one of the first things that investigators noticed was that the bodies were all buried together, which contradicted Alfred's story since he had told them that they had died at different locations and times along the hike. And since James and George had much of their bodies still intact, this suggested that they could have eaten more before starving again. As they investigated the surrounding area, they found a small beaten path that led to a crude shelter where Alfred had stayed, and inside the shelter was possessions of the dead men. Authorities put together a theory that suggested Alfred had killed the men before supplies had even run out as he wanted to rob them at first, but after he killed them, a blizzard arrived. He got snowed in, which forced him to live in the makeshift shelter for months, and when he ran out of food rations, he walked over to the dead men, sliced off bits of skin and muscle, and ate them when he got hungry. When the authorities finished investigating the scene, they buried the bodies where they were, and took the long hike back to the jail outside of Saguach, where they had kept Alfred in jail. Except, Alfred wasn't there. The problem was that Alfred's jail was just a small log cabin located on the Saguach Sheriff's property. They didn't want to keep him in town because the townspeople constantly threatened his life. And authorities thought that they could keep a better eye on him if he was on the Sheriff's property. Local authorities weren't happy with how much taxpayer money was going towards holding Alfred in his own private jail cell under constant watch by guards. He had spent months in the cabin and they never charged him with murder. They had no evidence of a crime and no murder victims until October. Before they found the victims, the townspeople had already made their judgment, as they believed that Alfred had misled his crew and led them to their death. And therefore, he committed a crime. Some even argued that he deliberately led them out in the middle of nowhere, just so that he could rob them and then kill them. Two of the men from the original group, Preston Nutter, and Oliver D. Lautzenheiser tried their best to discredit Alfred. They told the local papers about how Alfred was a deceitful man and a terrible guide, 
and soon the story had reached national and international news, and the public agreed that Alfred was directly responsible for the men's deaths in one way or another. As for the cannibalism, not many were concerned at the time, but the paper still portrayed Alfred as a savage cannibal, and back then people had a different understanding of what it took to survive in the wilderness. And this wasn't the first time that Americans had heard about men eating the flesh of their crew members for survival. Plus, cannibalism was and still is technically legal in the U.S., so they couldn't charge Alfred with cannibalism, but they could charge him with desecration of a corpse. In the end, they had only kept him in a jail for the attempted murder charge months previous when he tried to stab one of the search party members, and when authorities returned after finding the bodies, Alfred was gone. How he escaped jail is still a mystery but the running theory is that he had bribed a guard who passed him a makeshift key and gave him some supplies. Alfred went on the run for nine years. He traveled all over Arizona, Montana, Colorado, and he ended up in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Unknown to Alfred, his old crewmate, Jean Cabazon, was in the area. Jean was one of the men who had stayed behind in the Ute encampment until winter had passed, and it had been a long time since the two men had seen each other. Many years had passed and they both aged quite a bit. Alfred approached Jean, looking to buy supplies. And Jean thought he recognized the man, and it wasn't until Alfred laughed that he knew for certain. And even though they hadn't seen each other in almost a decade, Jean knew it was the man that pretended to be a guide, deceived his crew, and ate five of them. So Jean contacted the local sheriff and had Alfred arrested. General Adams came to Wyoming to confirm Alfred's identity and took him back to Denver by train. And when he questioned Alfred about why he escaped from jail, Alfred told him he was afraid of the townsfolk. They threatened his life and he thought the people would just go ahead and kill him with vigilante justice. He signed his second confession on March 16, 1883, and again he changed his story. This time he claimed that Shannon Bell had killed all the other men, and he killed Shannon in self-defense. He had left to find food one night. When he came back to camp, Shannon was standing over the campfire cooking a piece of flesh that he had cut from the leg of Frank Miller. The dead bodies rested beside the campfire and their heads were split open with a hatchet. Some had two or three wounds in their skull. And when Shannon saw Alfred come through the trees, holding a torch, he got up and grabbed the hatchet. And when he charged, Alfred shot him through the stomach and he fell to the ground. He then took the hatchet from the snow and bashed Shannon's skull to make sure he was dead. And for nearly 60 days after that, Alfred lived through the winter in a makeshift shelter out of the stray logs, making sure to build it far enough from the bodies in case they attracted predators. And when he got hungry, he trudged through the snow and hacked off pieces of flesh and muscles from the dead bodies. The cold winter preserved the corpses for months, and he was able to live like that through the entire winter. When General Adams asked Alfred why he changed his story again, Alfred just said, You know, I was excited the first time I told the story, so I just said the first things that came to mind. Again, General Adams tossed Alfred in prison where he awaited trial. And as the prosecution built the case against him, they argued that the only reason Alfred would lead the men through the mountains with such little food and no sense of direction was in order to rob and kill them. It was well known that six feet of snow can fall in a single snowstorm in the San Juan Mountains. Plus, they were warned by Chief Ure not to go. Even when the chief told them to follow the river because it was safer, Alfred had ignored him. Local hunters also claimed that even though the winter of 1874 was rough, there was still plenty of game and wildlife spotted in the area, so there should have been plenty of food for them to hunt. So Alfred eating the human body suggested that Alfred was either a terrible hunter or terrible shot, or maybe he actually just wanted to eat his crewmates. Later on, they also found out that Israel Swan had left to go on the expedition with Alfred with nearly $137,000 in today's money and a valuable Winchester rifle, which would give Alfred plenty of motivation to kill him. But Alfred's trial began on April 6, 1883 in Lake City, Colorado. He pleaded not guilty, which was a surprise to no one. And after only a week in court, he was found guilty of murdering Israel Swan, and he was sentenced to death by hanging. The report showed that the other men had most likely been killed in their sleep, but Israel's corpse showed signs of a struggle when he died. A local newspaper quoted the residing judge, M.B. Gary, who called Alfred a voracious, man-eating son of a bitch. He also said he wished that he could sentence Alfred to hell. 
and after a quick and merciless trial, the judge set Alfred's execution date for May 19, 1883. But there was one major flaw in the trial. Three days before his execution date, his lawyers found a legislative error that spared him from being executed. The issue was that his crimes had technically taken place on Ute Indian Reservation land, but he was tried and convicted under state law. Also at the time of the crime in 1874, Colorado wasn't a state yet, so he was saved by a technicality. In October 1885, the Supreme Court of Colorado reversed his murder conviction, saying that the Colorado state government couldn't sentence a man to death if the state hadn't existed at the time of the crime. So they suspended his execution date. They couldn't try him again for murder, but since Alfred could still be charged with manslaughter, they scheduled a second trial in Gunnison County in 1886, three years after his first one. Again, he claimed his actions were in self-defense, but still the jury didn't believe him. The case had been national news for years, and most were convinced that Alfred was a pathological liar and a killer. But luckily for him, this time his sentencing didn't involve capital punishment. His second trial lasted less time than his first, and on June 8, 1886, Alfred was convicted on five counts of manslaughter and sentenced to 40 years in prison. And at the time, this was the longest prison sentence in U.S. history. They sent him down to Canyon City Prison, where he spent most of his time in the woodworking shop. He even made a massive dollhouse for the warden's daughter. And after spending years in prison, Alfred and his lawyers appealed the case on five different occasions, and they were denied every time. So in desperation, he began sending letters to local newspapers saying that he had been unjustly convicted by a ruthless justice system. Polly Pry, a controversial but resourceful reporter for the Denver Post, caught wind of Alfred's letters. And when she looked into his case, she quickly saw the sensationalism of the trial. She knows how much the local news had jumped into his case and turned everyone against him. He had become infamous through the area, and the newspapers had made it seem like he was guilty before his trial had even started. So she tried to flip the narrative, and she used his service in the Union Army as a way to turn his reputation around. And she portrayed him as a victim of circumstance, rather than a savage man-eater. She argued that he was demonized for doing what he could to survive in the wilderness. And with her passionate words, she eventually changed the hearts of the locals. Their opinions of him had changed so dramatically that they began sending petitions and requests to the Colorado governor, Charles Thomas, and they begged for Alfred's release. At first, the governor denied releasing him, but as his last official act in office, he paroled Alfred on February 8, 1901. The records say that he had pardoned him due to medical conditions. Alfred left prison after serving only 18 years of his 40-year sentence, and the only condition was that Alfred couldn't profit from his story. So Alfred Packer lived the rest of his life quietly in Littleton, Colorado, and later moved to Deer Creek. In his last remaining days, rumors spread that he had left his life of meat-eating behind and actually became a vegetarian. Alfred died on April 23, 1907 at the age of 65. And some reports say he died of stomach and liver problems, while others say he died of a stroke. But his official cause of death was reported as dementia, trouble, and worry. And those that knew him said he was a great storyteller, and he was well-liked by children. And up to his final days, he lived a modest life, and was always willing to lend a helping hand. And because of his service in the Civil War, he was given a military burial with a veteran's tombstone. And because of his popularity and infamy, cement was poured over his grave to stop grave robbers and fanatics from digging up his body. Some also feared that fanatics would try to eat his body. 115 years after Alfred ate his travel companions, a team performed a forensic excavation of the burial site where his crewmates were laid to rest in July of 1989. They had actually found the bodies buried on private property at the end of a residential driveway and they were buried only 13 inches under the ground. It's really crazy to think that under your driveway, you never know, there could be bodies buried from the 1800s. But James E. Starr is a professor of law who specialized in forensics at George Washington University, studied the bodies with his colleague Walter H. Berkby. The team analyzed the bones to see how they died, and their skulls clearly showed hatchet and knife wounds, plus there was blanket fibers embedded into skulls. They were most likely asleep 
when they were killed, except for Shannon Bell. There was no question about Alfred eating them, since he had already admitted to it, and the professor concluded that Alfred had most likely killed his crew, took their belongings, and ate them. And after the research concluded, the remains were buried a few miles south of Lake City, Colorado, and ever since the burial site has become a tourist attraction for those who know the grisly tale of Alfred Packer. Today, his name is used for coffee shops, restaurants, cookbooks, and festivals, and his story has been fictionized into a movie, play, and a musical. He's become a legend in Western folklore, and his story will always be remembered as a cautionary tale for those who want to travel through the desolate Rocky Mountains with or without a guide. Wow, what a story, though. Yeah. Alfred Packer. Mystery, though. We still don't know 100% if Alfred was the one that killed all of the men or not. And we will never know at this point. I mean, there's no way to know if which story or version of events that Alfred told was true or if any of it was true. And maybe perhaps Alfred did in fact have this whole master plan. He premeditated that I'm going to take these people. I know that I don't know where I'm going, so I'm going to take them in the middle of nowhere, wear them down weak to where they're, hungry and starving and then i'm going to kill them with a hatchet and then i'll survive by eating their flesh seems like a very likely scenario to me as disturbing as it is to think about eating a human being for survival it does beg the question of if you were in the circumstance where you were out in the middle of the wilderness and you had nothing to eat in winter like you were going to die would you eat another human being or would you rather starve to death and die i mean me personally the thought of eating another human being is what makes me want to throw up so even if i could i don't even think it would go down because it's just that disgusting just for me the whole concept well certainly not raw i wouldn't eat human sashimi that's for sure yeah just like raw muscle i mean if you roast it over a campfire mm-hmm. would it would it be different enough that I you mean, could eat it. I mean, it, you it, gotta think too, like how hungry, are, if you've ever been really, really hungry, yeah. think about that times a million. It can have an influence on the brain and, totally. and change the way you see things. And Totally, I mean, I don't think anybody in their right mind would eat somebody by choice. Like, mm-hmm. like if you have the choice of eating anything else in order to survive, I think we'd all naturally go pick anything else to survive. But in these circumstances, it could be possible that Alfred, you know, things went down that the way they did. And perhaps the true villain of the story is Shannon Bell. And perhaps Shannon Bell, you know, they did sort of make this pact of, all right, you know, like we're running out of food and rations. We only have 14 days worth. We're going to, they end up being out there for 60. So it's like, you know, maybe, maybe you start having those conversations of, well, if one of you dies, like, Mm -hmm. and we don't have food, can we eat you? And I mean, it, I mean, it is a legitimate way to survive yeah. in those types of circumstances when there's no other food around. But it's also hard to think. It's like, man, I guess in winter, you know, I've never hunted in the winter, so <laughs> I, I can't neither. really say how hard it is to yeah. to catch wildlife, especially yeah. with the the weapons that they had in the middle right. of winter. But it's like the Native Americans were able to do it. And, uh-huh. You know, they didn't resort to cannibalism, so it's like. Hmm. It's a it's a little suspicious. I mean, the story is very mm-hmm. suspicious, and I think, I mean, what do you think? Do you think that Alfred? Yeah, I th- I think Alfred was a master manipulator who brought these guys or people in, on this trail or this route with him in the back of his mind, knowing that hey, no one, none of us knows how to hunt. Yeah, we got a river down yonder, but we're not going to go fish. So well, I'm it's d- frozen too. So <laughs> it is frozen, hell? but you can Go still ice fishing? break. You could, you know, you into could. the river, and you know, I I've seen this series called Alone on I forget what series it is, but there are people too to to this day who can be dropped out in the middle of nowhere with a few tools and survive for long periods of time, and you know, in Alfred's case, I think. He, he did enjoy or get some type of sick satisfaction from cannibalism and that's what made him happy at the end of the day and he would use other people to help mastermind his full thing of 
all right, I may not kill everyone, but I'm going to make so-and-so kill everyone until it's just me and this one guy left, right, and then right. I'm going to kill him. Totally. I mean, I think, so, I think I think he was kind of a mastermind, and he really sort of orchestrated this whole expedition to benefit him. Yeah. I mean, he probably full well knew that they were, you know, they had money, they had belongings that he could take off of them yeah. really easily. It's really like the perfect crime Yeah. for that time period. And I mean, what what's kind of a dead giveaway to me that this was absolutely malicious on alfred's part is the fact that he like escaped jail too and that you know like if you're truly innocent and this was truly like i just survived you know that would have been his story from the jump too Mm -hmm. his story changed so many times that he couldn't keep it straight that i mean that's a clear sign of a pathological liar yeah and when you know that somebody's a pathological liar it's very hard to trust their word that just goes out the window yeah absolutely meaningless so it seems and and it seems like everybody else in the area the townspeople i mean the general they all knew that alfred was full of shit yeah and that this was all about getting and the fact that he comes back in the town he but he gets drunk he parties oh, he's he gambling yeah like, he's buying new horse and right just blowing money left and right with his dead crewmates belongings which yeah is a dead giveaway Definitely. in my opinion i think didn't even take the time to put it all in one wallet he's literally had like five wallets four wallets on him yeah seriously so, it'd be like it'd be you know if this was truly like this story of survival and yeah this was so traumatic that i had to eat my because there are stories like that where people aren't aren't being cannibals because they want to it's mm-hmm. literally this person died i'm gonna die too if i don't eat this source of of protein yeah and so they go and eat it, but then afterwards they like feel immense regret and feel uh, yeah. remorse for what they did, even though it was a matter of like life or death situation. But here it's like Alfred's like, ha ha, I almost got away with it. And, yeah. Uh, or he did really did get away with it in, in the long run. And he's kind of laughing in everybody's mm-hmm. faces. And, and, kinda- and another big giveaway for me was the fact that his his body or, you know, he was eating good. So he still had like a healthy amount of weight on him. He didn't look like a right, skeleton who right. you would think if they were trying to survive. They would, they, I mean, anyone would lose a ton of weight. Totally. And so, he would have been sparingly eating human flesh. Yeah. But the fact that he's gorging himself with he, of yeah. human flesh, I and mean, he had that's a whole a worried. big hole Worrisome. with a bunch of them, you know, dead humans in there that he would go out to and just pull from that, like it was his refrigerator. I mean, that's just absolutely disgusting. I mean, it's it's really really wild because it's like when they go and they find the bodies finally, there you know, there's signs of animal. Obviously, animals are going to come in and and do things and tear bodies up. Yeah. But the fact that there was actual wounds and different things that were flayed and and aren't you know actual muscles mm-hmm. being taken off of it's like animals don't know you know they're not no. like okay i want this tenderloin right here off <laughs> right. the human i want that bicep yeah. no they just go and get whatever they whatever exactly. they can they're not going to pick it apart but to see that somebody had gone in there and like cut cut got, meaty like parts all the best off, meat yeah and like most of them had just skeletal remains left and but then like facial like he didn't eat the faces as far as we know he didn't go like a lot of animals go for the faces Mm -hmm. so the fact that all of their faces weren't gone and eyes gouged and mouths gouged if you think of uh the outlive pass and and with that whole story you know their tongues are ripped out eyeballs are gone and it as far as we know some of them had full beards and full Uh like you could see their full face right but then the rest of their body and the meat is just gone the meat is gone and there were organs still left intact and right like you're saying an animal would have got the organ as any organ as well yeah they're gonna eat that i mean that's good food good eating for them yeah they'll eat the intestines and all that all that nasty shit's left behind but he took all the the clear as day we have a cannibal cannibal so, that had himself a feast in the forest for 60 days <laughs> Jesus. and then came home and tried to concoct the story yeah in order to get away with it and and he got so lucky just even getting off on parole and you know after serving 18 years or so i mean that what I, he's so lucky he's Con- lucky he got manslaughter over for i mean he's lucky he literally survived mm-hmm. that trial like mm-hmm. in any other case his ass is being hung in the town yeah, square like he, right. he's dead he's a dead man and the fact that alfred packer they found a hole in, in the system during that time and lived and the rest of his it, life yeah. and god that's crazy it's crazy and now he's kind of this infamous figure out here in, yeah. Col- in the colorado mountains it's 
it's a really crazy story it is it's a really interesting one i just love this this time period in general i think there's just so many it's just such a crazy time and it's hard to wrap your head around what it would have been like to live in a period where it was just there's just so much freedom and and freedom in that you could get away with a lot of shit back then Mm -hmm. i mean eventually you'd probably get tracked down but it's like you could get away with way more back then than you could now i mean people got away with murder left and right back during this time so yeah yeah it was just it's just a totally different time period but yeah let us know what your thoughts are on alfred packer do you think that he premeditated all this and he's a cannibal and he just loved man meat and that's what that's what he led these people into the mountains for is to rob them and eat their man meat or was this a story a grand story of survival and alfred packer is the ultimate survivalist we want to know your thoughts also let us know if you want to hear more stories from the 1800s and the wild west because there's plenty more from where this came from so that will be it for us today here at lights out if you enjoyed this episode make sure you're subscribed to us on youtube Make sure you're subscribed on Spotify as well, or following us on Spotify, rather. Uh, We now have video on Spotify as well, so Spotify could be your one-stop shop for Lights Out going forward. But we will go ahead and wrap up today's episode there. We'll see you next week for another spooky one. And until then, Lights Out, everybody.